Thank you, Jerome and Giovanni. Um, it's great to be here and, and, and talk about uh, what we are doing. And it's also great to be back uh, working on free living marine nematodes at the molecular scale. Because I left working uh, on nematodes uh, way back in 2005 when I was in Plymouth Marine Laboratory. So this presentation actually helped me to actually get back to uh, the basics. Um, I've kept the title very simple and straightforward. Uh, it may give you an impression that I'm going to talk about a lot of things, but actually what I'm going to talk about is the kind of challenges that we face when you're working or trying to estimate uh, diversity of free living marine nematodes at the molecular scale in tropical coastal ecosystems, particularly ecosystems such as mangroves, which are relatively less studied and the uh, uh, complexity scales are uh, much more huge. So uh, let me uh, go back a little bit uh, to the more basic uh, understanding of our uh, coastal ecosystem and in coastal ecosystem actually uh, just like uh, in oceanic system the benthic pelagic coupling is a very very important component and in coastal system, this becomes far more challenging because in many of the coastlines are uh, shallow and there are a lot of land influences that are faced at the land ocean boundary system, such as the coastal ecosystems. And uh, many of the coastal uh, ecosystems have unique attributes or features that make them very uh, you know, interesting. And I'm going to talk about that. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the benthic sediment is very important because that is not only maintaining the flux, but also playing a very, very important role in many of the critical ecosystem processes, including uh, global biogeochemical cycles such as carbon and nitrogen, uh, particularly those which are very less understood in, in the coastal systems. And if we look at the benthic sediment, obviously the free living marine nematodes are a very important player, not only in terms of uh, composition, but I think also in terms of uh, function. But what we really do not know uh, how their composition is and what kind of functions they are playing, particularly in ecosystems which are uh, located in the tropics where the dynamics and the, and the scales of complexity are, are much more uh, huge. So that is what the challenge that we have uh, and uh, why traditional or, or morphotaxonomy is the basis of nematode systematic. Uh, we still tend to use or apply modern tools to actually accelerate the main biodiversity uh, assessment at low scales. So, uh, if you remember, uh, you know, working on the on the main nematodes, the molecular uh, aspects started a long time uh, back. And I think uh, one of those important critical papers for us uh, to work by Paul Dele's group and his colleagues. Uh, uh, a paper that came out way back in 2005, which talked about how we did morphological uh, volatility of nematodes for applications in molecular monitoring. And there, so if, you, if you recall, um, in, in tropical coastal ecosystems, uh, understanding the, uh, the structure of uh, free living marine nematodes you know, in terms of rapid biodiversity assessment is slightly more challenging. The reason being is that there are a lot of dynamic factors that play a very, very important role. Uh, and just to recap, if we go back to the, you know, uh, the old uh, days uh, of, of when molecular techniques were introduced to uh, look at biodiversity assessment of free living marine nematodes, one of the first papers that uh, that according to me was very important is this work by Paul Daly, where uh, he showed that how morphological vouchering of uh, nematodes are very important when you want to develop effective uh, molecular barcoding um, techniques or, or, or evaluate molecular barcoding for large scale biodiversity assessment. And this study was based on the 28S uh, ribosomal ribonucleic acid. Uh, uh, I'm audible, right? Hello. It's all good. You can keep going. It's all good. Okay. Very good. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Now, 
after that uh, obviously you know um, the in 2006 we act, we published a paper in, in marine ecology progress series uh, where we evaluated the dna barcoding uh, of marine nematodes uh, and we focused on the 18s and we also looked at the mitochondrial cytochrome oxidase 1 uh, we had some uh, challenges in terms of the mitochondrial cytochrome oxidase but we showed that the 18s ribosomal ribonucleic acid is pretty good if we want to accelerate biodiversity uh, assessment so okay um then there's another nice piece of work during that time was done by sophie um, from ghent and sophie showed uh, the population genetic structure in a number of uh, species of marine nematodes using molecular tools and sophie focused on the mitochondrial cytochrome oxidase 1 obviously if you look at all these three papers uh, if i'm not wrong the sequencing technology was sanger sequencing and sanger had limitation in terms of the cost and in terms of the number of samples that can be processed at a given time obviously uh, after that uh, with the advent of uh, next generation sequencing particularly the ros 454 came into the picture and this is one nice work by uh, vera fonseca and colleagues where they evaluated uh, the uh, ros sequencing technique to unmask the marine metazoan biodiversity uh, using the 18s uh, region and uh, subsequently the when the 454 sequencing uh, approach actually was replaced by illumina a large number of uh, papers started to come out because illumina uh, was able to process a huge set of uh, data set generate a huge uh, data set and there are a lot of papers uh, i've just given one example by uh, nasimento et al where they looked at uh, how you can assess the eukaryotic diversity and community structure in aquatic sediments using the illumina approach um, and in more recent time actually in this year in april this paper came out uh, where the newest uh, of the sequencing approach the next generation uh, sequencing approach uh, nanopore has been used uh, in this case the minion and where dna barcoding of nematodes have been evaluated so one thing is very clear that the technology that was used 10 or 15 years ago has evolved and now we are dealing with we can process lot more number of samples we can get lot more data uh, but the point is when you are processing the data there are some challenges are there and these challenges become more and more prominent when we are looking at uh, tropical coastal ecosystems uh, particularly for example the region where we work in the indian ocean so the idea is that from microscopy you go to molecules so obviously the morphotaxonomy still the basis but you look at the molecules that make up this complex metazoan group and from the molecules you start to deduce or elucidate the community structure and you don't stop just at the community structure level but you look at the functional significance why these communities are there what they are actually doing at a given time and period and why they are important in that ecosystem so the evolution has happened from microscopy to molecules where microscopy is still the pillar and molecules are adding to that pillar system to bring it more uh, robustness uh, here is one nice example uh, i'm giving this is something i just did uh, in, you know uh, out of uh, to show you uh, that when you're talking about robustness there is something which is the database which is very important so the sequence database is something that will play a very very important role and eukaryotic 18s uh, ribosomal ribonucleic acid sequence database is robust but uh, 
in terms of the number of sequences, unknown sequences are very, very huge. So here is what I have done is obviously these data sets are not generated by me. I have downloaded the sequences uh, and these sequences are coming from the post Gulf of Mexico area and you can see the coastal areas, uh, three points. And uh, what I've done is I have uh, processed the sequences, got rid of the Chimera sequences. And then I started to uh, look at the unique sequences in terms of 97% uh, nucleotide uh, cutoff and wanted to see out of those sequences, how many are actually representative of nematodes, particularly free living marine nematodes. And the databases were published databases were able to assign them into broadly three uh, major groups and the numbers vary depending upon the factors that might have played an important role uh, in this system. So you can, you could get uh, chromatorids, desmodorids, and obviously ascarids. Uh, now, this is what is you typically find if you do uh, Illumina sequencing of 18S of eukaryotes and if you select the regions, obviously the region of the 18S molecule that is select will have a very clear taxonomic resolution to give you a very clear picture of uh, what is uh, happening. Now what I'll do is, I'll now take you from here from this data analysis to some practical examples, the challenges that we are facing or we face on a routine basis. Um, obviously, before going there, uh, you can see that, that from the databases, uh, not only you can say how many number of sequences are there or the number of OTUs, you can also say which tags are there. So that's pretty good. Now, if I take this, and start to go into the scale or the level where we work at, then I'll show you some interesting observations. So the first example I'll give you is the west coast of India uh, and the east and the west coast of India is surrounded by the northern Indian Ocean. The western side is the Arabian Sea and the eastern side is the Bay of Bengal. And the example that I'm giving is two mangrove sites um, that are there where we have sampled some years back actually a lot, lot uh, long time ago and what we did is we did, we collected the samples by handheld cores and we collected drop three centimeters of that core and extracted the environmental dna and then we did the 18s uh, amplification did a very traditional approach of clone library and sanger sequencing uh, because we wanted to see how the resolution is. And if you look, we sequenced about 200 clones. Um, and the length is about 925 uh, bases. And between the two sites, both are mangroves, obviously. You can see that although these sites are not very far from each other, the resolution of detecting different groups of uh, free living marine nematodes are varying dramatically. So for example, in the first one, you can detect 12 groups, but in case of the second one, you can detect eight groups. And in both the cases, uh, one of the interesting observation is that the systems are uh, dominated by triple IDD, and, but there are also other groups which are showing some uh, changes such as Desmoridae, Microlady, and, and Monhistoridae. Now, we did not stop at the scale just at what those communities are there, uh, but we wanted to deduce some ecological attributes by looking at those communities. So when we started to look at these groups, we, we found that there are some groups which are dominant at the oxic and oxic boundary. So, the oxic and oxic boundary is very, very prominent in this kind of uh, mangrove settings. Water turbulence seems to play a very, very important role. And or in organic matter, what we found out was that in these sites, the organic matter, uh, if we started to look at the nature of the organic matter, the type of molecules that dominate this organic matter, we found that these are being dominated by tannic acid. Now, where from tannic acid comes down? Well, tannic acid is coming down when mangrove vegetation shed their leaves 
this leaf starts to break down and the first product that is formed is tannic acid. There is another interesting aspect is there in this sediment, uh, there is dominance of proteobacteria and we also found evidences of, uh, you know, uh, sulfate reduction is happening. So we found a lot of uh, D-sulfovibrio like sequences. So the question is that whether there is nematobacteria association and uh, there are a lot of literature that shows that but we want to say in a slightly different way what you mean is because tannic acid can be toxic so is it that the bacteria breaks down the tannic acid and then makes the sedimentary layer habitable for uh, the nematodes to colonize or it is also that the nematodes actually develop some micro niches where they harbor specific groups of bacteria which can help them to break down this tannic acid into other forms such as gallic acid or other uh, breakdown products so that they can prosper. Um, we found that between these two sites, the site, the carol site, the top site where we found more number of uh, groups of uh, marine nematodes we found that there were dominance of bacteroidetes like sequences. So that's an interesting observation because uh, they are also known to play a very important role in complex organic matter breakdown. Other interesting thing we found is that at the taxon level, Sabatieria was very, very, uh, you know, an important player. Uh, and we know that Sabatieria can tolerate, uh, you know, varying oxygen concentration. So we not only just looked at the, at the molecular structure of the nematodes, but we started to link the molecular structure of the nematodes with the molecular structure of the sedimentary bacterial communities, linked it to the geochemistry and tried to understand what factors were driving uh, this typical distribution pattern, given that the distance between these two sites are not significant and the nature of the vegetation is very, very similar. Now, when we analyze those sequences a little bit uh, more thoroughly, we found that there are a couple of sequences, actually quite a few number of sequences, which we could not say beyond that, you know, what group these are. I mean, you can say that whether they're Xyladies or, or Monhistoridae, or for example, chromadoridae, but we could not say what those things were exactly. Now, what I did was, these are the data that are a couple of years old. I analyzed those data even recent time and actually things have not changed. It's still, it has still remained the same. So, although the databases are getting populated with a lot of sequences, but the representation of the sequences from geographical uh, in, in terms of geographical coverage may not have been adequate or is not adequate enough to assign, for example, these sequences so that we can say what these exactly are. Besides saying that, okay, they could be Tycholamellus type or they could be chromatoris type. And that is something which is very, very important. So can we really say that these sequences are representative of novel species or is it because the databases are not populated enough uh, with enough number of sequences from tropical coastal ecosystems. And I think that is one of the challenges uh, that we face when you work on these kind of lesser known coastal ecosystems, which are very, very unique in, in terms of structure and function. Now what I'll do is from the west coast of India, I'll take you to the east coast of India. So if you look at the top left hand side box, that is where we are, the east coast of India, the northeast part of the east coast of India. And I have just uh, you know, magnified that box and this represents uh, the world's largest contiguous mangrove ecosystem, the Sundarbans. Now, this is a very interesting system or an interesting mangrove to work on. Why? Because in this mangrove, uh, uh, there are a lot of estuaries are there and in these estuaries the suspended particulate matter load can vary between 200 to 800 milligram per liter. I think it's probably second or third highest in the world. Which means that light penetration is very less. 
and it clearly implies that uh, phytoplankton driven primary production particularly photosynthetic primary production uh, that is not very high except in certain times of the year thus when the algal cells are dying they are actually settling down their number is not that significant to have an effect on the sedimentary layer second thing is this uh, the vertical profile wise generally these are very very shallow system and the other important thing is the fresh water flow is very very important here for example uh, during summer time or or during after the monsoon you know uh, the water flow is about 42000 cubic meter per second and it goes up to 120000 cubic meter per second and that means that has an effect on the suspended particulate matter also so this kind of dynamicity is there and in, and in this kind of dynamic settings trying to understand the uh, importance of the uh, marine nematodes and their uh, significance from the context of benthic pelagic coupling is also uh, very very important uh so here we have established a time series uh, more than a decade ago and that's what we work there are three sites that there which we work on uh, i'm not going to spend too much time on this but what i want to do is um i want to now give you that in addition to those time series site we have sampled a number of sites across that uh, entire uh, gradient of the sundarbans and beyond and this sampling is sediment sampling water sampling and obviously doing geochemical measurements now here what we have done is a, is a very interesting approach and i'll tell you why we adopted that approach is we have deduced the sedimentary bacterial communities so here what you have is the number of pair and reefs of uh, bacterial sequences that we have processed and we have assigned them into different bacterial phyla and from those representative sites where the signals of uh, proteobacteria and the bacteroidity sequences were high remember that's the information we got from the west coast of india there we started to look at the broad groups of uh, free living marine nematode members that are there and you can see for example uh, it seems that where the bacteroidity numbers and generally the proteobacteria numbers are high the groups of free living marine nematodes are more compared to the other ones obviously we have not completed the analysis of all the other sites so therefore i don't want to draw the conclusion right now but one interesting thing is also that if we characterize the organic matter pool in terms of the chemical composition we see that these are tannic acid and gallic acid dominated and the linking is pretty interesting because that's what we saw in the west coast of india so it is starting to make some sense when we look at the bacterial communities and we look at uh, the uh, nematodes i want to draw attention the nematode communities that we have deduced are not based on sequencing but based on morphotaxonomy and you must be wondering why we did not do the sequencing and i will get into it shortly so the question then comes down to is once again is it the in the sedimentary niche it is the sedimentary bacterial communities uh, that is driving the distribution of the uh, nematodes particularly when you are looking at mangrove systems or it is both way uh, both of these communities are playing a very very important role i think that is something uh, needs to be investigated and and we are working on it at the moment now i what i want to do is the previous slide i showed you the bacterial groups in terms of the phyla level but now what i've done is i have put the bacteria in terms of the families and i have assorted the sites or the stations 
in terms of high dissolved inorganic nitrogen and in terms of low dissolved inorganic nitrogen. That means now I'm trying to link the nitrogen cycling with the bacteria and ultimately trying to see whether nematodes, we see some trends in terms of the nematode communities we are seeing. Clearly we are seeing that the sites where major groups or, or more number of groups of nematode representatives were found, generally their uh, DIN concentration is much lower compared to the higher ones. So obviously it seems that because the sediment is uh, largely suboxic to anoxic uh, in nature in certain times of the year, uh, nitrogen uh, that is there entrapped in the sediment, that seems to play an important role. And how fast that nitrogen probably is flushed out from the system, from the sedimentary system, is an important factor that may be playing an important role in the terms of the communities that might be observed in those uh, sites. Now, what I'll do is, I'll juggle you down from the top of the East Coast. Uh, so that was the Northeast, so that black colored area down below, uh, that is again also uh, uh, facing the Bay of Bengal, a mangrove system, the Koringa mangroves. Uh, and here we work on a number of sites. What we did here is we collected the sediments and we did the illumina sequencing and we also did the morphotaxonomy. The irony is when we did the morphotaxonomy, the number of taxa were far more higher compared to when we did the illumina. So when we use the standard eukaryotic primers that have been used in other studies, in published studies, Unfortunately, the representation of the nematode sequences in the number of reads are less than 1%. So it is in no way reflecting the kind of trends that is there in the sediment compared to morphotaxonomy. And the bias of the illumina reads are more towards groups such as proteased alveolates and others. So obviously, Groups which are very, very abundant, they are getting preferentially amplified and the groups which are probably less abundant, they are not getting amplified or not getting represented in, in those uh, Illumina data. So here is an example or a challenge that we face where actually the representation of the sequences of, uh, of the groups that were interested may not be represented well enough compared to when you look at the morphotaxonomy. And this is something uh, we are increasingly seeing uh, in a number of samples along the east coast of India, where diversity in the overlying water and also in the sediment is really, really high. And dominance of particular groups actually kind of pushes the illumina reliefs in towards that direction. So, that's something uh, is a challenge that we are uh, trying to face and deal with. Now, what I'll do is I come almost to the end uh, of my talk. I think a uh, long time ago, we showed that, you know, the free living many nematodes and fungi, they tend to uh, have some sort of linking. I mean, our studies in, in the um, Western Channel Observatory long time ago, we showed that certain nematode species like Sabatieria, Tarsilingia, Viscosia, they tend to harbor or they tend to have very specific groups of fungal signals. Okay, and these fungi belong to aquatic hypomycetes mostly. And they are very, very specific. They are not found in all groups of or 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 or, or in all nematode taxa. Uh, this trend that we found in the coastal water, when we looked at the deep sea sites in the southern Indian Ocean, we also found very similar trend where uh, in closet uh, uh, samples in the southern Indian Ocean, we found that nematodes, some nematode taxa have um, association or signals or co-amplification of um, fungi. And these are not just individual nematode that were sequenced, also in the sedimentary DNA when uh, 454 was done, these signals were found. So that seems to be 
some interesting aspect or uh, or or association that might be there now um what i want to um, end up almost saying that in the sites where you work in the mangrove system we now see evidences of nematofungus uh, nematophagus fungus so actually fungi that are infecting the nematodes so it could be that one of the challenges by which that we are facing when you are trying to do the illumina that that the biasness of particular groups probably we can look at those data very carefully and see from those data set what signals are of nematophagus fungi and what kind of nematode taxa are you getting so trying to draw uh, ecological implications uh, by looking at a much broader scale or at a broader angle and looking at the molecules that are there not only nematodes but also there in other eukaryotes which could possibly shape the structure and function of nematodes so what we are um, now faced with is that these challenges that we are facing by working in the mangrove system is quite is not restricted because you are seeing the same thing in both the coast of uh, india at least and there are um, uh, diversity of different groups are affecting the signal and the and the group of our interest obviously one of the approaches could be that we design very specific groups of primers that will target uh, many nematodes but i think one of the other things that we could do eventually is in addition to that is try to re extract the data illumina data that we are getting and try to establish the long term link uh, between other groups with the free living marine nematodes so that we can start to understand the scale and magnitude of the biodiversity of uh, marine nematodes in complex coastal ecosystems such as the uh, mangroves obviously many of these are unpublished data we are still working on it some of it we are still writing the manuscripts and hoping to communicate so this is something you know i'd be very happy to take comments and suggestions from all of you and just to end up um, uh, i thank our research group members uh, in my institute the funding from the government of india and also uh, jeron and giovanni and everybody else who have been listening Uh, to me and sorry about the technical fiasco that happened in the beginning and i look forward to listening uh, and taking questions from you thank you